everybody hello 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 and welcome 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 i'm dan your friendly fishmonger from dansfish.com i'm glad you could be here with me on this wednesday night we do this every wednesday from 7 p.m mountain time until about 8 30 mountain time that's that's nine pacific if you're if you're or nine i <laughs> got it all backwards nine eastern if you're mountain challenged um and we've got our usual shipping report. We have what I think is a really cool giveaway, some samurai gouramis. I'll talk to you a little bit about them and a little bit about what I've learned about them over the years. And the shipping report's gonna be interesting. There's been a lot going on this week. Give you some updates about what's going on here at dancefish.com. Have some uh, really cool fish to show you. And then we'll get to your questions and comments, just kind of a discussion about aquarium fish, fish keeping, shipping fish, building fish rooms, breeding fish. Um, when it comes to freshwater fish, I can help with a lot of things. I don't know everything. If I don't know about it, I will refer you to the community because we have a great hive mind here in the chat. A lot of really experienced folks who've kept a lot of kinds of fish. And if I haven't kept it, someone here probably has. Um, so with that, let's get to it. So the shipping report. Oh, before I do the shipping report, I wanna do a quick sound check. So. I want to know which sounds better. The setting I'm on right now, does this sound okay? Or I'm, I'm going to switch it. It'll go silent for half a second, and then we'll get to another set. This one, does this one sound better? Or do they sound the same? So here's option two. Does option two sound better? Do you like that? Or back to option one. This is what we've been doing most of the stream, this option one. I don't know if they're different or the same. It sounds like they're about the same, according to Kato's Aquatics in a same. Option one says someone. Someone likes two. Someone said same, same. Okay, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of difference. Okay, that's good to know. So, as you know, last week, uh, the camera stopped working, so I had to reload it into OBS, and my worry was that I might have undone some of those uh, fancy settings that that becca did for me and uh i i think i have one of those channels with settings and one without but i i could be wrong <laughs> anyway seems like seems like uh seems like it's doing okay and then how am i looking uh michael says that um that i'm a little bit fuzzy visually from what i'm seeing it looks like it's probably okay, but am I fuzzy for you guys? Because again, I had to redo a whole bunch of settings. So if I'm fuzzy looking, let me know and maybe I can change latency or something like that. Um, everything is good, looks good. Okay, so um, Michael, you might want to refresh or it could be your, uh, your internet connection that's making it funny. It looks like it's looking good for most people. Well, of course I'm on it. How could it not look good? <laughs> this bald head never disappoints <laughs> just the top of your head yeah there it is i knew it was coming i knew it was coming yeah we're very glowy we are indeed very glowy all right well then i'm all i'm just altering the brightness a little bit there oh we're gonna call that good we're just gonna call that good okay let's get to the shipping report it's been eventful. So, last week I reported to you that we were 98.42% success over the last 12 months shipping. And as of today, we are still at 98.42% shipping success. There's been no change in our success uh, rating over the last 12 months. But this last week was not good. Every box that we shipped out um, on Monday was delayed at the UPS hub. And we don't know why. But every single box, none of the fish we sent Monday arrived until today. Luckily, we packaged well enough that there were still very few losses, but there were definitely more losses than normal, which is why our shipping percentage stayed the same and it did not rise. But I think that that's, uh, that's pretty telling evidence that we're doing something right if we have a delay of one day in shipping. They sit in Louisville at the UPS facility for an entire day. Um, and our, our percentage doesn't go down. So even though we lost more than normal, it did not go down. So I think that's good. 
Um, there were a couple mix-ups though. So if you were a customer that uh, got some wrong fish, I just want to apologize. Um, we we accidentally mixed up a couple boxes of fish. So <laughs> we'll be sending the right fish to those customers. Hopefully they see that as bonus fish instead of like, well, what am I going to do with these? So um, I, I can tell you why, and I'm not saying this as an excuse, but the reason that happened is, is uh, we have two new folks working today. We, we made a new hire and we have someone here uh, doing what is our, our working interview. And so we had two folks brand new helping pack the fish. Normally that wouldn't be a problem because I would be over there with them training them uh, and carefully going over everything with them. And we started the day like that, but mid-afternoon, early afternoon, uh, we got a call from our driver that was picking up our import in Denver that Marv, our cargo van, had broken down. So Marv broke down about two and a half hours out of town. And so we kind of had to drop everything and go figure that out. Uh, how to get Marv off the freeway, how to rescue the fish, how to rescue the driver, and all that stuff. So that took me away from the packing station. Uh, we had new people there. We had experienced people there as well, don't get me wrong. But um, yeah, so a couple things got mixed up. So just a weird week, just a weird packing day. That, that was just a very unusual circumstance. Still in all, I think we did okay overall, but we did definitely mix up at least one box. We sent the wrong fish to one customer and the other wrong fish to another customer. So, um, yeah. But it's been a long time since anything like that has happened. When was the last time? Maybe over two years ago that a wrong fish, no, maybe not that long, maybe a year. I, I don't know, but it's been so long I can't remember. So um, quality control is generally very good. Uh, just every now and then some weird thing happens and uh, something slips by. So we're still, I think, number one. I still would put our stats up against any company out there. But for us, it was much worse than normal. For the industry at large, it was still very darn good. So <laughs> that's the shipping report. Hmm. All right, but you know, we'll, we'll get that all taken care of. New folks will get trained up in short order and uh, the van shouldn't break down every day. So I think it's just a, it was just a weird circumstance. Okay, let's talk about the giveaway now. I am very excited about this giveaway. This is one of my favorite fish and this is definitely my favorite picture I've ever taken of any fish. And I also love the fact that when you Google Samurai Grammy, we show up in number one. Does that happen for you guys too? Okay, I'm gonna do a little test here. I'm just curious if I Google Samurai Grammy in incognito, do we still show up number one? We do! That is awesome. Number one spot in Google if you Google a photo image of Samurai Grammy. This is one of the best pictures I've ever taken of a fish. I'm a bad fish photographer, so whenever I can get one right, it's amazing. And she was on fire. She was fully fired up and wanting to spawn. So she looked great. So I love that fish. This is the giveaway fish. This is the Samurai Garami. They really do look this good. And they really do look this good often. Not only when they're actively spawning, but when they settle in and feel um, comfortable, they color in. Here's a good picture of a pair. I think this is a male. You can see his buccal cavity. This is a female in everyday dress once she's settled in. This is a very good picture as well. Like they are stunning. This feels like it might have a little saturation fired up on it. See how saturated the greens are and the, the reds are here. So in the blues, I, I don't know if I believe that pick, but this one I believe. That looks, that looks like that could actually be her. Anyway, they're amazing fish. So where do they come from? These fish come from, oh, I want to show you the rest of our pictures. So here's a female. 
Here's a male and he's incubating. See how his throat's a little bit distended here? This is what we call a buccal cavity, and that's where they hold the eggs while they incubate the eggs. And oddly enough, in samurai gouramis, it's the males that do that. In every other gourami species I know of, it's the females. Okay. So this fish comes from, um, I believe it's Indonesia. Or is it Sumatra? One of those islands out there. I can't remember the exact island. But the important thing is that it comes from peat swamps, generally. It also comes from some white water environments. But generally, it comes from very acidic environments. Like... Seriously, fish puts the pH in their environments of like three to four. What's the pH? I'm just curious. What is the pH of vinegar? Vinegar is two to three. What's the pH of uh, lemon juice? About two. Okay. What's the pH of orange juice? pH of orange juice is 3.9. So these guys come from habitat that's as acidic as orange juice or as uh, some of the more alkaline lemon juice. Very acidic environments. That means some white water environments as well, according to Seriously Fish. But what that means is that they don't experience much in the way of bacteria or ammonia at all. So in low pH environments, ammonia gets converted to ammonium, which is a different chemical entirely and is pretty much non-toxic to fish. It's like the difference between nitrite and nitrate. Nitrate, you can have quite a lot in your aquarium. It's not going to kill your fish. A little bit of nitrite or ammonia will. So same kind of relationship. So they are not used to ammonia at all. The other thing is that they're not used to, like I said before, is bacteria. Because in those very acidic environments, those are kind of sterile. They're kind of antiseptic type environments. You can uh, sterilize things pretty well with like vinegar, right? Because it's so acidic. So the key to keeping these guys healthy is when you first get them in, make sure they're in an environment where they aren't going to be overloaded by the new pathogens they'll be exposed to in aquariums. Because they have zero immunity. Excuse me. <clears throat> that enchilada I had for dinner is, is taking its revenge. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so that's the key. No one is um, breeding these in any large numbers in the industry yet. I, I am working with a breeder that's working on it, but so far they've been able, unable to produce them in large quantities. But there is a breeding program that they're pursuing. And I, I'm supporting them in that. And as soon as they crack that code and are able to breed them in large numbers, then I'll definitely be sourcing from them. But all of these are coming from their natural habitat, which generally is very acidic. So you've got to take, when they first come in, you've got to take the time and care to get them over that transition. Our aquariums are generally very hard and alkaline water-wise, high pH compared to what they come from. And so that means there's a lot of bacteria and other organisms in our aquariums that live in our aquariums that cannot live in their natural habitat. So they, so they don't have the immunity to com combat that. But I have found that if you get them over that hump, they are super hardy. Once they've settled in in uh, had a chance to recover from, from being imported or, or transferred, very, very hardy. They do come in with some nematodes, so they do need to be dewormed. We use levamisole for that very successfully. I don't think we've had any that were super sensitive to levamisole. There are some times when you treat with levamisole that it can, some fish are, are sensitive to that. It can kill fish. Um, these guys have taken it like a champ. And we've put hundreds of them, yeah, I'm going to say many hundreds of them through Levamisol without any problem. Well, I can tell you exactly how many. We've put 350 of them through Levamisol um, over the last couple months in six different aquariums without any problems. So they, they, they took it no problem. 
Um, that's the key with them. You don't have to keep them in super soft acidic water. You just have to make sure that when they transition to our normal hard alkaline high pH water that we have in our aquariums, that you're careful when you do that and you take care of them and that the water is clean and that it has no ammonia in it. So a well-established aquarium, long-term, mature, not going to have an ammonia spike, and also clean water parameter-wise. Okay, so if you do that, then they should settle in. And again, once they settle in, like once they've been through our uh, quarantine regimen, they're pretty darn hardy. So they've, our water is super hard, 8.3 probably right now, uh, pH and a hardness of 300 parts per million calcium carbonate, which is very, very hard. And uh, so they're used to that, so they should do fine. Now, even though they're a fairly decent sized fish, I mean, they're a two inch fish, but they're not like a tiny little um, Dario Dario or something. But even so, their mouth is tiny. So look at the size of that mouth compared to the fish. The mouth isn't like this whole front of the head. It's just this tiny little thing right here. So they're a decent sized fish, but they're still more or less a micro predator. So they can't take really large food. What that means is you can keep them with a group of like chili rasboras or other small fish without any problem. This is a very peaceful gourami. It's not like your, uh, you know, blue or gold gourami or three spot gourami or is it Cosby or Crosby? I can never remember gouramis that can uh, be kind of vicious. It's not like that at all. Very peaceful fish. The one thing I would say about keeping them with other fish is samurai gouramis are slow feeders. So it's going to be very difficult to keep them with anything that is a very food aggressive fish, something that just swarms the food and, uh, and will gobble it up before they get a chance. They go around all day and pick little tiny organisms um, off leaves and uh, all the stuff in their environment, uh, you know, deep bed of decaying leaves, that kind of thing. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention about their habitat is that the uh, forest canopy, the rainforest canopy, is over the streams that they're in. So very little sunlight gets down there. So they're not used to bright light. They get used to it pretty quick. But the streams they're in, they have like tons of decaying leaf litter in the bottom. Like if you stepped in it, you might sink up to your waist in just leaves. So there's all kinds of surface area for them to go down in and examine and pick off all day long, picking off little tiny organisms, little worms and different stuff that they find. And that is one reason that they are shaped like this. Basically, they're mimicking a leaf. And if you've ever seen them swim, they swim very slowly and deliberately and you can't hardly even see the fins move, right? Kind of like a leaf fish, same idea. So the shape here, the coloration of the males, very leafy. I guess the females would just be a very pretty leaf, but you can kind of see the leaf shape, right? Here's the stem, and then here's the leaf. Anyway, because of how they feed, they're outcompeted quite a bit by, by quick feeders. So I just make that a, a limitation on what you keep them with. And also they're very peaceful. I wouldn't keep them with anything that's really boisterous or, or aggressive in any way. But uh, as long as it's appropriately sized, not real aggressive or boisterous and peaceful, I think they're probably going to get along with it. They're a very good community fish. Ours are feeding on everything. At this point, they're used to flakes. They're eating flakes really well. We also give them like big pellets or big wafers that they can graze on for a long time. They really love frozen bloodworms. They like live baby brine shrimp. I said baby funny, but baby, they like live baby brine shrimp, um, all that kind of stuff. So they'll eat a wide variety of them, of foods without any problem. They eat prepared foods without any problem. So I think give them a wide variety, just like any other fish, um, and, and they should do fine for you. So that's the giveaway fish. I think as long as you have a well-established mature aquarium where you're not going to get parameter fluctuations and any tank mates are as described, I think they should do fine for you. If you don't have a nice mature tank, please don't enter the giveaway. 
um, I, I don't think they'll do well with parameter fluctuations. But if you do have a home for them and you think you could give them a good place to live, then please feel free to enter the giveaway. It'll be for a little group of these. And hashtag, of course, Samurai, S-A-M-U-R-I, I'm sorry, you, <laughs> let me do that again. Sorry, mods, hashtag S-A-M-U-R-A-I, no spaces, caps don't matter. That's how you enter to win a group of these really cool fish. All right, so that is the giveaway. A couple of other things that are going on that I think are uh, interesting that I'd like to mention is this. So we, um, if you haven't been subscribed to the newsletter, you're missing out. Let me show you a couple things we're doing. So this is the latest one. This is just me going around the fish warehouse and looking for um, stuff that looks really good. So the first thing that I noticed walking around the fish warehouse was these grunters because they've now darkened up. I've shown them a lot, but they were kind of the brown juvenile coloration. As adults, when they darken up, they turn almost black with beautiful gold coloration. These are just absolutely stunning. I think these are the, these are the coolest, rarest fish we have. I just, this is one of those tanks where I stop every time I walk by the tank. It's just a pleasure to be able to experience them. So those guys are looking awesome. The Lenguru, Melanotania species Lenguru, have come into their own as well. Um, this black stripe is coming in very strongly on the dominant males. The yellow color is coming in. And the oranges as well, but I didn't capture it on the camera. There's orange and there's a nice breeding flash, but I didn't catch that on camera. The Trophies Du Boise, looking fantastic. I love the juvenile coloration of these guys with their, their white spots. And then I finally got a good picture of peacock gudgeons. I've been trying to get a good picture of these guys for literally years. I'm such a bad photographer that it took me that long, but I think I finally got it. I think this does that fish justice. What I don't like about it is the background. I had just scrubbed the tank out, and so I scrubbed the algae off the front, and so you can see all the little bits of algae floating in the water. But he was up, and he was like, posed perfectly so I took the picture anyway. The dragon blood peacocks are big enough that they're starting to show their color and this isn't hormones these are this is their natural color it's no hormones on those fish. The half beaks are looking fantastic I love the paroensis this is one of my favorite killifish I know I say that about every killifish because they all are but I, I just a gorgeous fish and they're doing awesome for us I don't think we've had a single loss and they're eating everything. They're not picky or anything like that. The Weitzmanai, we have Corridor's Weitzmanai that were bred and raised by the one and only Rick May. So these are aquarium bred and raised by hobbyists. This used to be like a phantom. It was discovered way, way back in. And then for decades, no one saw it alive again until I think 2004 is when we finally saw the first ones alive. They're hardy, they're easy to breed. And so they're becoming more readily available. But uh, that's a bucket list fish for a lot of, uh, a lot of catfish keepers. And then, of course, the samurai gouramis. And then something else I want to show you. If you go to dancefish.com and you want to get the newsletter, just click on View Previous Newsletters, and you can see them all. And this last one, if you missed it, or penultimate one, second to last one, is a whole thing about live bears and why they're not as hardy these days. What's going on with live bears? I've been working with an aquatic veterinarian, and I think I can tell you why live bears are not doing as well. So if you just go down there and click on, um, click on view previous newsletter at the bottom of the homepage at dancefish.com, uh, you can read that. And I think it's worth the read. I'll be doing a part two. So part one talks about a, um, a pathogen that we discovered with the and and how we worked around that and how we solved that issue oh i don't like the camera angle at all on that there we go that's better and then the next one's going to talk about the second issue with guppy hardiness and that that has to do with uh importing and sourcing and supply chain and i'll get into that deep in the second issue or not second issue but the 
part two of that particular topic. But I know there's a lot of people, me included, who have really struggled with live bears over the last few decades when, when they used to be super hardy. And I've always wondered why. And working with some vets, I now have some answers, and I, I want to tell you about that. So, uh, Cheers. Needed to wet my whistle here. Oh, the other thing about samurai garamis. Sorry, my when I screw the lid onto uh, my water bottle, it makes a heck of a noise sometimes. It's rather rude, my water bottle. The other thing about samurai garamis is they're not available all the time. They're quite seasonal, and uh, when they are available, there's a lot of uh, there's a few different suppliers of them, and I've only found one that does a good job consistently. So that's the trick, finding, getting them from the right place. Um, we got about 50 of them a couple of months ago, I want to say. They did fantastic. And so we've brought in quite a bit more now because in, you, they might not be available again. It's one of those things like when it's available, I get a lot because uh, the availability, availability is very sporadic. So that's some, some of the down low or is it low down on the uh, supply chain with that fish? All right. Let's see here. Couple of updates here. Um, one is, man, this has been like a nice, wet, cool spring. It feels like I'm in Scotland or something. It's kind of amazing. Everything's super green. Um, our water source, the, the river just right outside our building over yonder, is nice and full the streams are running it's absolutely beautiful and the fish are getting like a lot of amazing water right now with all that rainfall so it's kind of beautiful and then i'm thrilled to say that we have uh hired someone so we have another full-time helper which we need desperately we're growing a lot and we need the help and uh we have someone else here this week that we're interviewing so hopefully that'll you know, result in another helper. We'll see how that shakes out. And then the other exciting thing is our, our veterinarian started last week. So we have a veterinarian in residence that will be here uh, Thursday through Sunday, or to Sunday, um, every week, helping us with our fish. We've done all that we can um, without a veterinarian here <laughs> on our location to help fulfill our mission of getting you guys healthy fish and just basically making sure we're doing things as humane and healthy as possible by the fish. The only way to improve that at this point is to bring in a professional. So i um, very excited about that. We were able to diagnose a few things this last week and some of them have been puzzles for quite a while. Some of them are fairly obvious. Like uh, there was a case of epistylus. That's, that's fairly obvious, especially under the microscope. Made a little video of that so you can see what that looks like under the microscope. That's on the YouTube channel. But I'm just so excited to have a veterinarian helping us. And I can't wait to see what kind of progress we can make with that. So some good things happening here. Okay. Let's get to your questions and comments now. But before we do, I want to thank my moderators sincerely for being here and doing what they do every week. Really appreciate you folks. First one I can see, first comment is Big Cat. Now that Dan's Fish ships to Canada, oh yeah, I should mention that. We're shipping to Canada and we think we fixed the issues. There were some issues um, early on, not with getting fish to Canada alive, but with the software needed to process the orders. And so a lot of people from Canada were trying to order and being told they couldn't. And it's because we had some trouble figuring out um, UPS's delivery schedule and uh, it was telling a lot of people that could get the fish next day. It was saying that they couldn't. And so we've, we've changed things around and I think we've solved that problem. So if you're in Canada and you tried ordering from us before and got the message that said, sorry, we can't ship to your location. Um, a lot of those locations, it turns out we can, there was just some confusion with the software. So I think that might work now. Anyway, 
Big Cat, now that Dance Fish ships to Canada, can we lowly Canadians enter these giveaways? I wish Big Cat, but we still can't do that. The, the shipping to Canada um, is expensive enough that uh, we would lose even more than we do currently on the giveaways monetarily. I just don't know if we can afford it at this stage of our company. We're a little startup company. Um, every penny goes back in the company. There's not huge profit margins and stuff. We're still scaling. We're not out of the woods yet. So um, I hope we get to the point where, where we could comfortably do that. But where we're at right now, I think it would be a disservice to the company. We need to put every penny we can back into, uh, back into the company still to manage the growth. But Big Cat... I hope to get there. I, I see a time when we might be able to get there. Nick Rector. There it is. So they would be okay with guppies and neocaridina shrimp. Uh, the samurai gromies would be okay with neocaridina shrimp. I think they would definitely pick off molting shrimp. They would definitely pick off young, small shrimp. I have never kept them with neocaridina shrimp. I think they would be fine, but without having tried it, I don't know for sure. If anyone here has kept samurai gouramis with neocaridina type shrimp, would you chime in and let us know your experience? Um, with guppies, yes, as long as there's not a whole bunch of guppies. Guppies are very fast to the food. And uh, if you had like a whole horde of guppies and just a couple samurai gouramis, that could be an issue. But if there's just a few guppies and it's easy to spread the food out enough that everyone gets some, then I think that would be fine. I, th I think temperament-wise, they would probably be fine. The caveat to that is occasionally I'll find a guppy that wants to spawn with every fish, no matter the species, and just harasses them, no matter what their species, especially if it's a male with no females around. So every now and then a guppy gets, you know, a little harassy, but, it, but that's the caveat to that. U.S. Scaper, how can I condition my Tetris to spawn? I think the easiest way to do that is separate the sexes. So move the females and males to separate tanks, feed them heavily, and the females should, quote-unquote, ripen, that's what we call it, with eggs, get full of eggs. And once they've been uh, conditioned for a week or two, if they're fed well and maybe multiple times a day, they should fill up with eggs. And once you see that happen, you know, go ahead and spawn them and you get a big spawn all at once. So that's how you do that. And with most Tetras, I don't think that that what you feed, like, you can condition them on flake food, good quality flake food. Now, live food would be the ultimate. Um, frozen food would be good as well. But even if you just have flake food or pellets or something, I think you can still condition Tetras if you separate them. Maybe feed two to three times a day. Well, the next comment, Dragon Layer says, I have an overabundance of Skeeter larva after eight days of pouring rain. Yeah, so that's a great food to condition fish with. Mosquito larva is like perfect. Joseph stuck. Oh, Joseph, I hope you get unstuck soon. Lurker here, but love the content. Hey, Joseph, thank you so much. And all hail the Lurker Nation. Joseph Sneed, Joe Sneed, what is the best way to... Oh, Joe, that's all I got. Let's see here. Let's see if Joe Sneed uh, finished the comment later. I don't see it yet. If I see it, I'll answer it. <laughs> Lucas, where do I sign up for the newsletter? Aha! Well, if you go here, that's our uh, homepage right here, right? Dan's Fish. Ta-da! Homepage. Scroll down to the bottom. You can see it. And then right here, join our newsletter. You just enter your email address right here at the bottom of our, our homepage. And you can join the newsletter. And then you will get them by email. U.S. Scaper, <laughs> not Scraper. Um, how can I condition my Hypen Sisters Plecos to spawn? So, U.S. Scaper, I am not a big Hypen Sisters Pleco breeding expert. So, for the details, hopefully someone in the chat will chime in who's more expert than I am. But my experience with different Plecos like Bushies and similar fish in a way, like quarries, fish that need a lot of food in order to, to bulk up for spawning is just lots and lots of food. But from what I've heard from Hypencistrus breeders, it can take them a couple years before they finally spawn. Um, but 
again, let's let someone more experienced with hype and sisters chime in about that. Take everything I just said with a grain of salt because I'm not that experienced with hype and sisters. On the breeding front, I've kept a lot of them now. For a couple of years, I've kept, well, hundreds and hundreds of them. But uh, as far as breeding, don't have a lot of experience with that. Tony Adams, although I will say, our L236s and our L236 uh, RB line Super Whites are both getting big. I think they're getting close to breeding size. Um, they're, they're definitely good size now. Tony Adams, when you get a second, do you have a timetable on when you will get more Corridors, Equus, Horseman's Quarries? I don't have a timetable. I wish I did. If I see that fish available from a good supplier at a price that makes sense, I'll get it every time. I absolutely love that fish. The problem is, there's only one supplier, one breeder of them that I trust so far. There's a couple other folks that offer them, but they're not the breeders. They're like general supply chain, like industry sources. Um, their prices... I would probably have to sell their fish if I source them from them for something ridiculous, like, I don't know, 80 bucks, 120 bucks. I, I don't know exactly, but something really high. And the source there is less, uh, I don't want to say it's iffy, but I wouldn't be buying directly from the breeder. I would be buying from an exporter that buys from different breeders and different sources and amalgamates things and, and then sends them on. With a fish like Equus, I really like to buy directly from the breeder. So that's the only way I've found so far to do it in a way that I'm comfortable with. <laughs> What's been eating Gilbert Guppy? Well, probably Camelanus redworm if you haven't done a little Levamisol on them. Um, guppies just have that frequently. Cave of wonders, wonders, wonders. I hear it echoing down the cave. I have to say, I miss seeing the fish behind you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, don't worry. Um, so there's a project that this curtain here, this curtain here, let's see if I can show you. Oh, yeah. This curtain, that's the wall, that's the aisle, and then uh, it's tilted up, that's the top of the curtain. Okay, that was... That was a waste of time. Sorry, that was not as cool as I thought it was going to be. But it, it's hiding a project. So don't worry. Behind the curtain is something that eventually I will be able to show you. And uh, it won't just be me in a curtain anymore. And I think you'll be happy. Okay, hold on. There we go. But I hear you. Fish are much better looking than I am. Jeez, I really screwed the lens up on that one. Yeah. I think I'm having an OCD moment there. <laughs> Jeez. Tony Adams. Thank you. I'm not in any rush. There are part of my next tank project. And honestly, y'all are the only place online I trust enough to spend that kind of money. Oh, Tony, thank you. That's a high compliment. I, I really appreciate that. Um, we worked hard to earn that trust. And uh, hopefully, we always uh, deserve it. We're trying our best to always deserve it. And yeah, when it comes to fish and live animals, you know, no rush. Let's always make sure we have the proper environment set up and we know what we're doing before we bring them in. I try really hard to do that. But the problem with, that I face is that I don't always get the fish that I order. So depending on my supplier, I might order fish A and what they'll send me is a completely different fish. And so, in some cases, I've had to scramble. I remember one was when I ordered um, Carina tetraodon uh, Arubinesco. Let me show you this fish. Let's see if I still have a picture of it. Yeah. So I ordered this fish. A small little two and a half inch puffer. And what I got instead was dragon puffers. They were like, how big were they? Three inches? Four inches? 
So I ended, uh, that's what I ordered, and I ended up with these. These super uh, predatory ambush puffers, which I love. I still have one of them that I keep as a pet. But when you're expecting those little guys, and you end up with these big boys, like, <laughs> it's like, what is going on? So I like to say in this industry, you order what you order and you get what you get. And you try your best to be responsible, but when they send you something that's like completely different than what you ordered, sometimes there's a bit of a scramble. Another one happened where there was a mix-up and they sent me like a two, two foot long, maybe a little bigger, a fire eel. I purposely avoid big fish because I'm not set up to keep them. I had to really scramble for that one. So, yeah, every now and then something goes sideways. But in general, in general, we're able to uh, be well prepared and research all the fish before we bring them in. Wanna cobble? I was hoping for some advice on food for a hillstream loach. Mine doesn't seem to be eating. So wanna, um, they will pretty quickly start eating hikari massive or delight pellets, but with hillstream loaches, the first foods we give them are frozen bloodworms. They'll eat those pretty readily. When they first come in and they first start eating, it takes them a little while to discover the food and realize what the food is. But it doesn't take more than a couple days. And then by the end of the first week, they're like waiting for the food. And you put it in and they go out there and flutter in the sand and stuff, you know, to get it pretty quickly. But for, for the first week or so, they're pretty slow to finding it. So if you just got them and they're in the tank with other fish, they might be real slow to the food for the first little while till they discover what it is. So here's how we do hillstream loaches. First of all, we turn our flow up all the way. So they're getting a ton of fresh water all the time because they like that. And we turn our aeration up all the way. So they're getting a lot of turbulence on one side of the tank. And they'll often just hang out right above that, right? That's, they, they like that. We start feeding them bloodworms on day two. So they get here, right? We settle them in. And then the next day, we feed them some bloodworms. And I'll put in a Hikari Massive or Delight pellet. And they won't eat it, and I don't expect them to eat it. I just put it in so they get familiar with it. And then a few hours later, I go and I remove the Hikari Massive or Delight pellet. And I only feed a few bloodworms. I don't feed a ton. I'm introducing them to foods. I'm not expecting them to eat a lot. If I did a ton, they, they just wouldn't eat them. Second, and then the next day I do the same thing. And as I see them eating the bloodworms, I give them a little more the next day. And at day after that, same thing. A little more bloodworms, right? Eventually, after a few, not even, it doesn't take that long. After a few days, most of them are like, where is the bloodworms? And then I can feed quite a bit of bloodworms. But I try not to overfeed. I try to just introduce new foods slowly. I've been doing the Hikari Massive or Delight this whole time. Uh, now what I do, once they're eating the bloodworms well, is I put in the Hikari Massive or Delight pellets, and I wait an hour or so before I feed them their bloodworms. After doing that, doing that for a few days, they start eating the Hikari Massive or Delight pellets and start looking forward to them and searching them out. Once that happens, now you can rotate. One day you can feed bloodworms, the next day Hikari Massive or Delight pellets, and you can start introducing like algae wafers or a veggie component. Same kind of thing. Put that in an hour or so before you're going to feed the food that they know, just so they get used to it. They might not eat it for the first few days. Just remove it, right, so it doesn't spoil the water, foul the water, and then feed them the food they will eat. And after doing that for a little while, they'll eat whatever the new food is. So I would recommend with Hillstream loaches feeding, um, first of all, they really enjoy a lot of water movement, if you can provide that. Second, bloodworms, and then slowly introduce all the other foods uh, as described. And in my experience, it doesn't take long before they transition over and get very excited about feeding time, no matter what you're feeding them. If it's water stable, kind of large clumps of food that are water stable and won't just disintegrate and kind of foul the water, that's definitely what I would use for hillstream loaches. Anything like that, wafers, pellets, um, I probably wouldn't feed them flake. I probably wouldn't feed them 
tiny little nano pellets and things. I would feed them large water stable foods that I could remove if they didn't feed on them as they're getting to know them. Joe Sneed, what is the best way to get wild bettas to eat prepared food instead of live only? As described above, same thing. Um, feed them the prepared food an hour or so before you feed what they normally eat. And for those, you can feed flakes and things. I would just do a very small amount so you don't spoil the water because they probably are not going to eat them for a while. Um, we also definitely use Hikari Massivore Delight pellets or Hikari Carnivore pellets. Um, a quick plug, you can find the foods that we feed down below in the description at our Amazon affiliate link. And then if you do that and buy something, we get a little kickback. So that helps us a little bit. But the foods, a lot of the foods we feed, you can find at that link. And uh, one reason I really like Hikari Massivore Delight pellets is they're very water stable. So I can put them in there come back four hours later and scoop them out if they haven't been eaten and they're still nice and solid and I can remove them without, you know, them just disintegrating all over. So, um, but Joe Sneed, same, uh, same process. That's kind of how we get all our, our new fish to eat. So we bring in all kinds of fish and some of them are a little, are quite a bit pickier than others. We don't starve our fish in order to get them onto a new food. We just introduce slowly like we described. And I haven't found a fish yet that would, that if I starved for a couple of weeks or whatever, would eat the introduced food and wouldn't do it the other way. I think the, the slow introduction is uh, definitely as effective and definitely more humane than just, I'm just not gonna feed them until they eat this. So that would be my take. Holy cow, there's been some user activity here. Rye Guy Outdoors throwing down a super chat. Thank you so much, Rye Guy Outdoors. Um, with a crying emoji. Hmm. I don't know what that's about, but I hope your day's going okay, Rye Guy. <laughs> Mike Chofo, thank you for becoming a member. Welcome to the Fishmonger crew. We really appreciate the memberships. Every little bit helps, and that little recurring revenue every month um, over a whole bunch of members becomes very meaningful to our company, so we appreciate it. Stephen P. 2003 says, Happy birthday. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about, Stephen. I'm not 45 today. I'm definitely, if, I, if, I, if it is my birthday, I'm definitely 35 again. <laughs> Happy birthday to you as well, Stephen. Jackson Fish Room, the live stream. Thumbs up. I got new fish for the fish room. All right. Awesome. I'm glad to hear you got new fish. That's always exciting. To me, it's like Christmas morning every time. I still get, after all these years, I still get really excited when I'm bringing in new fish and I open up that new box and I, I get to see them. <sighs> Excuse me. It's been a long week. I haven't had a day off in several weeks, so I'm kind of tired. Um, but, and it, it, yes, especially if it's like a new thing that I've never seen before, but even when it's fish I've had many times, like sometimes you pull them out and you're like, oh, those are the best ones I've ever got. Like it's, it's a neon tetra or a cardinal tetra, but you're like, yes, this batch is great. They did a great job on these. You know, they're still that. So I love it. Mountaintop Puffer Keeper. How are you doing, Matthew? I think, I hope things are going well for you. <laughs> it says, if they ever mistakenly send you Tetraodon du Boise in place of Spotted Congos, I'm in. I actually thought of you. Um, I am in the early stages of attempting to get some fish from uh, that region. They had Du Boise on the list, but I looked further and they don't actually have any in stock. So I, I thought about you. I was going to contact you if, you if they had them in stock and see if you wanted some. Verena guy, happy birthday, Dan. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah. I actually wasn't going to announce it, but looks like it got out. <laughs> yeah. 45, man. 45 never looked this good. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, Dan. <laughs> Rye Guy Outdoors says, I love what you do, Dan. Thanks, Rye Guy. I really appreciate the support. Rye Guy's been like a 
outspoken supporter and that is much appreciated the the best thing people we love the super chats we love the money people throw at us that's all great and appreciated the best thing people can do is word of mouth um you know the the thing we're doing it doesn't make sense to buy from us if you don't know our story it doesn't make sense to buy from dancefish.com if you don't understand what we're doing and what the difference is and all that because we're more expensive uh, we're more expensive because we're trying to do things right but if you're just shopping online for fish and you see oh these are 2.99 and this other place oh these are 3.99 and then you come to dance fish and it's like those are 6.99 that's like twice as much as anywhere else you're not going to buy from us right it really takes word of mouth and one way i know we're on the right track with fulfilling our mission of uh you know humanely sourcing maintaining and transporting fish to our customers is the word of mouth so people are paying the high prices finding it worth it and telling people about it so that's one way we know and that word of mouth is the most valuable thing um, because it takes someone doing that before someone is like oh that's why their prices are so high maybe you'll try them right otherwise there's definitely that that uh that hurdle to jump kenneth olivo happy birthday dan do you have any advice for treating guppies with camelanus worms in a planted i do tank with shrimp and amazon puffer and a pleco yes um all right the thing i don't know is does levamisole hydrochloride kill shrimp let's see if we can figure that out real quick uh, does anyone know that's in the chat? Is Levamisol shrimp safe? I've looked this up before, but I can't remember. Levamisol is a safe, effective, da 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 da, does not harm the biofilter plants or invertebrates, including shrimp. It says Oz Discus. I don't know who that is. Okay. This is just a form. Okay, it's, it's seriously fish, but it's just a form. Shrimp keepers. I've given a dose of levamisole, and the cherries are fine. Okay, so their cherry shrimp were okay with it, from that person's experience. Not snail safe. I can definitely attest it's not snail, snail safe. I have killed a lot of snails with levamisole. Um, that was at 10 milligrams per liter. That was the dose that killed the snails. At uh, 2.5 milligrams per liter, I don't think it kills snails. That's our, our current dose. Okay, hang on. I know 5 grams will treat it. Oh, sorry. Did I say 10 grams? It's probably 10 milligrams per liter. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm not a veterinarian, all right? Look up any doses or anything I say on your own. Get confirmation from a professional, whatever, um, because this is not my world of competence. But yeah, 10 milligrams, not 10 grams per liter. That would be insane. Okay. So I'm not for sure, but that quick Google search makes me think maybe it's safe for shrimp. Um, but... The other stuff is definitely safe for at, uh, again, I'm not a veterinarian, confirm this, but at 2.5 milligrams, not, not grams, milligrams per liter, uh, we have found it to be perfectly safe with all those fish that you mentioned. That's been our experience. And as far as I know, it's the best thing for treating Camelanus redworms. And it's pretty simple. Um, the way we do it, what I would do if that was my fish is I would treat, I would wait a week, I would treat again, I'd wait a week and I'd treat again. I'd probably do three treatments. Of Levamisol. Let's see here. Okay, here's another one. Spoiled sushi. Happy birthday, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Well... <laughs> yeah once you once you get 45 it's like do i have to tell people it's my birthday <laughs> like i said 35 again but thank you so much spoiled sushi still one of the best usernames 
I've ever seen for like a aquarium fish chat chant, you know, event. Xanadu do giving away five memberships. Thank you, Xanadu. That is super helpful. The memberships are amazing and giving them away is a, is a massive support for us. So very much appreciate it. The, I think I'm all caught up on everyone that threw money at us. If I missed you, it's, it's just not showing me, in which case I apologize and I'm still grateful. Let's see here. Scrolling down here, Coro works. I think Alexander Williams has samurai in one of his takes. He does. I've seen the, the recent posts about trying to spawn them. Uh, with Neo Caradina. Oh, yes, and Malawa shrimp. But he intends to find, he intends for some shrimp lists to be picked off by the fish usually. Food web type deal. Okay. All right. That's good to know Coro works. I did know he has uh, samurai gouramis, and I think he's breeding or attempting to breed them. But I did not know that they were in with shrimp. So that's good information. Joe Mineta, thoughts on Odessa barbs in a summer tub. I think that they would do great. I think if it was densely planted, you might end up with a whole bunch of babies in that tub at the end of the summer, but I don't think you'll see them. Um, and here's why. Odessa barbs are beautiful, beautiful fish, right? Absolutely beautiful. They have this nice red on them. But if you look at the dorsal surface, what you're going to see when you look down in your tub is a dark dorsal surface. This, the beautiful coloration, all the reds and things, are on the sides. I mean, there's a little bit of lemon yellow on the dorsal fin, and that's really pretty. But uh, what you're pretty much going to see is a dark dorsal surface. A lot of fish have that because they don't want, you know, a kingfisher or some other bird to be able to see them and dive down and grab them. It's an anti-predation thing. But it also means it's difficult for you to see them. If you have a pond with a, a dark bottom, or even if you don't, over time there's going to be enough like detritus and stuff that builds up on the bottom, even of a white tub, that it's going to probably be pretty dark on the bottom. You're looking down, you're not going to see them. So if you want to observe the fish in the pond and enjoy them visually, I would not do Odessa barbs. I would probably do maybe one of the like neon rosy barb because those are very bright. Maybe one of the gold barbs, if you want to do a barb species. Something that's really bright on the dorsal surface. But if the goal is not necessarily to do that, to, to see them all summer, but to spawn them or grow them out or something like that, then absolutely, I think they would thrive. Hoon Aquatics gifted five dance fish memberships. Everyone's getting on board. Hoon, thank you so much. It's good to see you, my friend. I hope you're doing really well. I hope all the rainbows and everything you keep are doing awesome. Uh, Hoon's got some amazing fish. Follow them on Instagram if you don't. It's, it's worth it. Freaky fish lady. Heck yeah, get your freak on. Have a blessed bee day. Thank you. Thank you, freaky fish lady. I appreciate it. It's a, uh, well, so... Yeah, my, my daughter's out of town with my wife at a national volleyball championship she's competing in. And so it's kind of like, it's fine, like, yay. Like, I'm glad they're doing that. But when it's your birthday and, you know, your family's out of town, it's kind of like, all right. I work with good people, so it was, a, it was a fine day. But it won't feel like a birthday till they're back, really. Tiny Town Trains TV. Question. Still trying to get my first tank set up and cycled. Hope you will be getting more marbled hatchets and coral red pencils. I'm definitely planning on getting more marbled hatchets, and we will be listing uh, more coral red pencils soon. Uh, one of the tanks of coral red pencils that we brought in, and you might see this in Bob Steen uh tour video when he gets around to releasing it, um, came in and, and had some issues, so we just held off on those for a bit. They're all healed up now, and they've been good for a while, so those will be listed soon. Uh, we will get in more marbled hatchets uh, as soon as our supplier has another good batch. That batch was pretty darn good. And honey gouramis. Honey gouramis and, okay, tuna and lollius. And most other gourami species. Gouramis that are routinely uh, produced by fish farms, let's say. Right now, we don't get involved in because... There is a virus that is uh, 
very, very common. Um, actually, I should say, I can't remember if it's a virus or some kind of mycobacterium. Let's look this up. Garami disease uh, virus. Okay, it's a ritovirus. Um, that's right. I have yet to find a supplier of garamis where I don't deal with eridovirus. So I stop bringing them in if they're like farm produced. Now the, the croaking garamis and the uh, samurai garamis and chocolate garamis and sparkling garamis and um, licorice garamis, those types, that's fine. But your dwarf garamis, your honey garamis, your all your general garamis, a lot of eridovirus. So I just stopped. Now, I did come across a, a different supplier and brought in a group of garamis. They're pearl garamis. I brought them in from a farm in Israel. And those so far seem to be doing very well. They aren't showing of any of the... Uh, like ulcers or body sores or anything like that that is typical uh typically what is symptomatic of eridovirus so i'm hopeful that maybe i found a supplier of garamis that uh that i can start bringing garamis in again so we're starting just with one group of pearl garamis testing them making sure they're okay if they are we might bring some others in but that supplier does not have honey garamis available, at least not at this time. I love tuna. I think it's one of the uh, coolest species of garamis out there. One reason I like it is it's not as aggressive. Let's, let's show people these fish. So we have dwarf garamis, right? Which we all know and love. These are so beautiful. Unfortunately, they're usually infested with a virus. And then we have honey garamis in all their various color forms, which are also amazing. Like, look at that thing. That is just so pretty. So, so pretty. Even the wild form of them is a very, very pretty fish. Both of them very pretty. Both of them, you know, don't get very big. These guys, though, the males are jerks. So, one thing I really like... Oh, I'm not showing these at all. Sorry, I'm really bad at my job sometimes. These are the dwarf garamis. They're mean. Often they can be quite aggressive. Now, not always. I'm not saying you can't keep them or can't keep them in community tanks or in large groups or whatever. But often the way we keep fish, just like one or two or whatever of a species, they're quite aggressive. The honey garamis, not nearly as aggressive. So I really like honey garamis for that reason. They're small, like a dwarf garami. They're beautiful. Different coloration for sure, but still a pretty fish. But they're also, I like the red ones as well. They're also not mean like these guys can be. So I would really like to find a virus-free source for both dwarf garamis and uh, honey garamis. But I've been looking for years and so far haven't found it. I'm hoping that this new supplier is it and that I can start sourcing garamis from them. Tiny Town Trains TV. Oh, I already did that one. 318 folks are here. That is pretty darn good. I like that. I like that a lot. Oh, I've got to check something here. Just one second. Just one moment. It'll be worth it later, I promise. So if you're listening on the podcast, I'm looking up some information that I can use uh, later in the live stream. Okay, just a, just a moment. I want to make sure I, I remember what this person wants. Okay, just a moment. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, sorry about that. That'll all make sense later in the stream why I had to do that. I promise. Okay, Lucas, can you talk a bit? <laughs> can, can you shut me up? I, I'm a talker, man. So yes, I can talk a bit. 
about C5 Corydoras pantanalensis. I think they're a bucket list fish for me, but I don't know if I'm comfortable buying them on sex when I want a breeding group. Well, I understand that. Ours are juveniles. Ours are definitely unsexed. You can buy, let's look at this fish. If you don't know this fish, folks, this is beautiful. When they mature, especially if they're males. Okay, so here's the fish in question. Corridoris pantanalensis. Look at the, like, pattern on these males. Really, really pretty. Something you should know about this fish, super cool, sexually dimorphic though. Here's a male, here's a female. And the males aren't always colored in. So often you're going to have a fish that looks like this. Now, quite a bit of the time they'll look like this, the fish that everybody wants. But you should be aware that they are sexually dimorphic and that the males aren't always colored up. Anyway, if you want big males, if you want big fish that you can sex, you can get them, but they're all going to be wild caught. Those are not, I mean, unless you have like a Corydoras hobbyist breeder local to you at your local fish club or whatever that breeds them and raises them. And they'll probably sell them as juveniles though. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone is selling Pantanalensis as adults that are aquarium bred and raised. I think they're all wild caught. I, I avoid the wild caught ones. They, um, especially on an expensive fish like that, I think it's super risky to bring in wild caught fish. That supply chain's rough on them. And uh, if they don't have the right treatments for the parasites and things they carry, they're not gonna last long. So yes, you can do that. You can get wild caught ones. And if you tr have a trusted source for something like that, you can get them sexed. But if you want aquarium bred and raised ones, and I think that that's a much gentler supply chain, and I think that the odds of them being healthier are much better if they're aquarium bred and raised, then you're going to have to get unsexed juveniles. I don't know of anyone selling them sexed if they're aquarium bred and raised. Okay, I probably said that five different ways. Sorry, sorry sometimes I, yeah, repeat myself a lot. I know, I know. See, when you're a professor, my background is as a, a college professor, and th there's this saying that repetition is the mother of all learning. So when you're up in front of students, one thing you're purposely doing is saying things three to five ways, the same thing three to five ways, hopefully in a non-boring manner, because you're trying to uh, help them remember it. And I was a professor for years and years, and uh, I think that habit never left me. So sorry. <laughs> it's, just, it's just part of me now in a lot of ways. But anyway, but here's the thing about Corey's. They need to be in groups, right? So even if you're buying unsexed juveniles, quarries do best in fairly decent sized groups. So hopefully you're buying a big enough group that the odds of you getting a decent sex ratio if they're unsexed juveniles is really high. So I don't think there's a whole lot of risk on the uh, breeding group front when you're buying a group of juveniles. So that's my thoughts on that, but I, I totally understand putting a lot of cash down on a fish is risky, and especially when you want a breeding group. I do, however, think it's much riskier to get large wild-caught adults than it is um, smaller aquarium bred and raised juveniles. In the end, I think it's, you're going to have a better result with the aquarium bred and raised. Now, I, I don't want to make it seem like all fish that are collected in the wild, all quarries or whatever, are bad. It's not that at all. And there are some sources that do a very good job caring for their uh, fish, but their wild source fish. But it's a lot riskier. Nick Rector, do you have to do anything special for feeding the bamboo shrimp? Are they fine with the particles and other things already in the water column? Thanks. So we feed them like Bacter AE. We'll uh, smash up flake and put it in the water column. We'll give them baby brine shrimp. Um, so yeah, we do feed them other things, but it's not difficult. So they're in a tank. They were in a tank with plecos. So we would feed the plecos uh, their big pellets and their blood worms and stuff. And they would generate some particulates from that. But we would also make a point of 
feeding the shrimp something in addition. So I think you could keep them with other fish and just feed them like smashed up flake food or a, a wide variety of stuff and they would be fine. But I would definitely feed them for sure. If you ever see them, they should be, it's, it's like cheerleaders, right? They should be pom-poms up, fans up, right? Going like this. If you see them walking around using those as like claws to look for food off substrate and stuff, then they probably need more food in the water column. So that's one way to judge that is by their behavior. Okay. Artist Lisa Matthews received my Rick May CPDs last week. Yes, the best CPDs ever. They are beautiful and arrive safe and sound. Good. But they are hiding in a heavily planted tank with Aspidorus. Suggestions on getting them out of hiding. Okay, this is going to sound like I'm a used car salesman right now. No offense if you're a used car salesman. <laughs> Just a saying, folks. There's a lawyer joke here somewhere, too. Um, anyway, it's going to sound like I'm trying to sell you more fish. I'm not. My best advice for CPDs is get more CPDs. Generally, if you get a good-sized group, in my experience, they'll be out and about. So here's, what, here's why I say that. Um, I'll start out with a couple hundred CPDs in a tank. And I'm not recommending everyone do that, but we have 40-gallon breeders. They get 100% water change, like, frequently. Like, there's a lot of water exchange going on all day long in those tanks. Our tanks can handle that bio load. When there's 200 in there, they're out. They're, I mean, after a few days, it takes a little while. But once they know that you equal food, they're out. And when you go by the tank, they come beg for food. They're out and about. Once that group gets down to about 30 or so, they start being less outgoing. And once that group gets down to about a dozen, they're hiding all the time. So from that, what I deduce is that large number of fish out and about and not shy, small as that group gets down, they get more and more shy. You could also try to mitigate this with uh, like other dither fish. We found that rice fish were excellent companions with CPDs and they were much less shy when the rice fish were in with them. I'm sure there's other fish that would work too, but I think rice fish is the one that we had the most success with. So it sounds sales salesy of me because I'm like, well, just buy more fish and they'll be fine. But that's not what I'm trying to do. That's my honest opinion on that. So that's what's worked best for us. Survival of the fish. Now, I should say this too, though. Um, let's see here. You got them last week. Oh, okay. Give it a couple more weeks before, before you give up on them coming out. It could take a, a few weeks before they really settle in and feel comfortable. One way we draw them out is when we feed them, we often feed them, you know, large pellets and we put them towards the front of the tank and they'll definitely come out for that once they learn that that's where the food is and that that is food. So maybe doing that will help draw them out. Survival of the fishiest, you're not showing us your screen. I know, the, the grommy thing, massive fail. I know, I know. <laughs> I fixed it eventually. <laughs> Ice Demon 1515. Is the new Grammy supplier supplying just male or both gender Grammys? They're too small for us to tell. Uh, Johnny and I looked at them and we tried to sex them and we're like, well, that one might be a male and that one might be a female, but they're not, I mean, those Grammys get decent size and these are inch and a half, two inches, something like that. They're just not quite developed enough for me to be um, confident on their sex. But yeah, I'm sure they're I'm sure they have both sexes in there. They're just, they just scooped up a bunch of unsexed juvenile grommies and sent them to us. They didn't like sort them. 319 folks are here. That is not too bad. Thanks for being with us, folks. Thanks for spending a little bit of your Wednesday here. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment to share this out with someone who you think would enjoy the stream, let's get more folks here. That would be awesome. We do want to get up to 30,000 subscribers as well. We're quite a ways from that, but if you wouldn't mind subscribing, helping us get there, and also you'll get some notifications when we do cool stuff. And if you can't think of someone who would like this stream, then uh, go ahead and invite an ex-lover. Let's make this interesting. 
Garamis in the 60s were not encumbered by virus. Oh, sure. Yeah, Garamis did great for a long time. And then the virus happened and it spread like wildfire. And I have not been able to find a virus-free supplier uh, that I can you know, be confident in yet. Although I have to say, the ones from Israel, so far, doing great. Paul Soltero, I've been keeping a tree of honey garamis in quarantine for three weeks, all healthy. That's great, Paul. I hope they do well for you long term. By the way, I'm not saying that every dwarf garami or honey garami on the market has a Rito virus. What I'm saying is I haven't found a supplier for me that I can uh, be confident doesn't have a Rito virus. So if I said they all have it, I didn't literally mean that. I'm sure there's good sources out there. I just haven't found the one that works for, I just haven't found one yet, to be blunt. Tracy S. Wow, I want one of those Corys. Yeah, Corys are amazing, but don't get one. <laughs> if you're buying Corys, get a big group. They, they do so much better. They're very social animals. Amisa, please never apologize for teaching. Oh, yeah, but, uh, but I'm also from the entertainment industry, and the cardinal rule is thou shalt not bore. Um, I, I have a, a close friend and mentor. Um, he has seven Emmy Awards, and that was as he was mentoring me and helping me uh, as I established my career in the entertainment industry. That was his cardinal rule, the motto. So it's drilled in my head, thou shalt not bore. So of course I won't apologize for teaching, but if I ever do it in a way that's boring, then absolutely I'll apologize. <laughs> and over-repeating can get boring. Ginger Graves, my mom was a high school teacher. She never forgets her 50 plus year old children are not still in high school. She repeats a lot. Yep, that's funny. The 50 year olds are still kids to her, huh? <laughs> that's hilarious. By the way, Ginger, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Dan's Fish Warehouse Open House event. For folks that don't know about this, I should mention this. Okay, how do I get there? I go to my channel. That's what I do. Okay, let me show you guys how to find out information about this. So if you go to the Dance Fish channel, click the community tab, and you will find right here the information on our 4th of July weekend event. Um, we'll be having an open house July 2nd and 3rd right here. You're free to come on in, wander around, look at uh, 450 tanks-ish that have fish in them right now. Some of them I bet you've never seen before. Some of them I bet you've never heard of before. Well, unless you follow this channel and I've talked about them a lot. And we'll, have, uh, we'll be providing some barbecue and just kind of hang out, chat fish, have a good time. Casual, no big presentations or speakers, just fish geeks hanging out, eating food and looking at a bunch of fish and talking about them. And maybe going on some like trips up to the mountains or whatever if people want to. And then there's this too, if you want to carpool up or coordinate with someone else, um, then here's a thread where you can, you can chat about that with other, other people to coordinate some travel. So that's on the Dan's Fish community tab, uh, on the community tab on the Dan's Fish YouTube channel. We have a few folks coming. I don't know if it'll be just a few or if a bunch of folks will show up, but uh, we'll be good either way. Chevy Fish is having major Wi-Fi issues. It's all right, Chevy Fish. Take a deep breath and uh, enjoy. No worries. No worries at all. Okay, Jesper69. It's 818. Okay. Hey, do you recommend getting more than a pair for starting a guppy, col guppy colony for genetic reasons, or is it okay to inbreed? So yes, it's okay to inbreed. You just have to be very selective. And kind of, I would suggest getting more than a pair. I, I, I think, I'm, yes, I would guarantee getting more than one pair, but you should understand this is, if you get three to six pairs from the same breeder, odds are they all came from the same pair. And the odds are that those fish, yeah, it's just, the odds that there's a ton of genetic diversity from that are, are pretty slim, the way people do guppies. Now, not always, there are some serious guppy breeders that keep large enough groups that they can rotate who breeds with who, 
and keep a, a diversity of genetics while maintaining a clean line. That does happen. But generally, if you're buying from like a hobbyist breeder or something like that, they probably just came, they'd probably have a pair, they spawned them, and now you're getting a group of, of offspring. So they're all going to be brothers and sisters. Now, if you're buying from an industry provider, then yeah, there'll be some genetic diversity there because they probably have large breeding groups. So just some things to think about. But it's with guppies, you could start with a pair. It would be better if you had more than one. But uh, plenty of guppy breeders have started with a pair and created beautiful lines that they've maintained for years. Um, maybe they put new blood in it every now and then. Maybe they outcross to something else and bred back, but it can be done. Okay, let me just check one more thing, and then we'll do this giveaway. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do the giveaway. So the giveaway right now is for a beautiful group of these beautiful fish, samurai gouramis, one of my faves. There are, what, two, uh, 324 folks here. That's not bad. Any one of you could win that's entered. Earlier in the stream, I talked a lot about these. Uh, the main thing I would say is mature, steady tank, and peaceful tank mates. You don't want parameter shifts on these guys. If you maintain steady parameters and don't stress, stress them out with boisterous tank mates, then I find that they're super hardy. And by the way, they get to be very outgoing as well. This is not a fish. Once it's settled in, if it's comfortable, it's not going to hide all the time. In my experience, anyway, they're out and about all the time. And they, they start begging for food. I find them very personable. Okay, so any hoodles? The winner out of 230 eligible entries is Rich Lindstrom. Rich, no way. Rich, congratulations. Rich is a friend of mine. He's been out. Uh, he spent a week with us once uh, just on the Dance Fish uh, Dude Ranch, helping me ship fish and stuff. Uh, good to see you, Rich. I'm thrilled that Rich has won. However, Rich, as you know, rules apply. You have two minutes to chime in. Let us know you're here. That's how you claim your winnings. If you haven't chimed in in two minutes, then you forfeit your winnings and we choose somebody else. You have till 8.25 to chime in, Rich. I'd feel real bad if Rich won <laughs> and then didn't, didn't claim his winnings and we had to do that. But rules is rules. We're going to stick with the rules. All righty. While we're waiting for Rich to chime in, or not, as the case may be, Let's get to one more question or comment. But I mean, on the guppy question, it, of course, it's always better to start with more and to start with uh, genetic diversity. If you can ensure that's happening. I'm watching the, the chat. I'm like, come on, Rich, come on, come on, come on. I'm rooting for him. <laughs> He's here. OK, OK, cool. Did he chime in? I mean, them's the rules. Oh, cool. There he is. All right. Rich is here. Good. I was hoping you were rich. Anyway, Rich, you know what to do. Send us an email. Hello at dancefish.com. H-E-L-L-O at dancefish.com with your first name, last name, and mailing address. And uh, we'll coordinate uh, shipping time for you. I'm glad you won, man. That's awesome. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Say hi to the fam for me. Ryo. Outdoors has thrown down a couple super chats. Thank you so much, Ryo. Really appreciate it. All right. So we've got a few more minutes. Uh, we'll do answer some more of these questions and comments. And I fully expect the number of viewers to plummet now that we did the giveaway. But I know that there's a faithful core that will stay till the bitter end. <laughs> All right. Fish folk, do you sell many U.S. natives? There's very few new U.S. native species I sell, but I sell quite a few of them. Rainbow shiners we sell, and we sell a lot. Um, that might be the only native species we have right now. So there just aren't that many places that supply natives to a business like mine. I'd have to kind of go out and collect most of them. But I would love to. If there was a breeder out there that 
bred some U.S. natives uh, in quantity and I could get them for a price that made sense. We pay 25% of the retail cost landed, that, that includes the shipping costs, then, uh, then I would love to do it. I would love orange throat darters. I love crimson shiners. I love fiery black shiners. I love rainbow darters. I would love um, ugh, blue nose shiners, welky eye. Jeez, I love that one. Um, I love fundalus catenatus. I love fundalus uh, chrysotis. I love Leptolucania omata. I would love a lot of them. I, um, red belly dace, southern red belly dace. Yeah. As long as it's legal in my state, I, I can't really keep anything that's uh, native to Wyoming. I can't keep any game fish. But besides that, I can do most things. Okay. Well, looks like a lot of folks have dropped out now that the giveaway is over. And so I'm going to do something I've wanted to do for a while. I'm going to reward you guys that have stayed till the end with a second giveaway. This is provided by an anonymous donor. Um, someone who came and, and toured the, uh, the fish warehouse with his family recently. It was a pleasure to meet you. You know who you are. But they've provided a couple giveaways in the past and they wanted to be anonymous. So I'm assuming they want to be anonymous again. And I'm kind of doing this on the, the fly. So I, what I really should have done is reached out and made sure that's still the case. But I'm pretty sure that's the case. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. So this is for a $100 gift certificate to dancefish.com provided by a very friendly anonymous donor. We're going to make it easy. If you'd like to enter to win a $100 gift certificate to Dan's Fish, it's hashtag dollar sign 100. Hashtag dollar sign 100 to enter that. And let me uh, make that so. Let's make sure that that's working. Let's make sure the eligible users are going up. They are. Okay, okay, this is working. So hashtag dollar sign 100. Hashtag $100. All right, and we'll do that drawing in a bit. And thanks for, thanks for not just being here for the giveaway, folks. We really appreciate it. The, uh, I've been wanting to do something like this for a while. Just to thank you guys for being hardcore, the real fishmonger crew. <laughs> All right. Paul Soltero, have you found that quarries are a little scarce right now? Not necessarily. What I have found is that the Brazilian imports or exporters are still not quite up to speed yet. And I think a lot of the quarries that folks were getting were coming from the Brazilian exporters. And, uh, Without that, then I think that the market is probably a little scarce on a lot of those quarries. So, yeah. Ginger Graves, I'm arriving on the 2nd and should be there sometime between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. Awesome, Ginger. I'm excited to see you. KG, any tips on keeping panda quarry wrigglers alive? Got some eggs earlier this week and woke up this morning to some wrigglers. I've never bred quarry, so I was looking for some advice. My best advice on the wrigglers is just keep the water clean. So the way I do them is I just put them in a little plastic tray with about an inch, maybe half an inch to an inch of water, a little clump of java moss, and that's about it. And I change that water, oh geez, two to four times a day, let's say. My goal is just to keep that water as clean and fresh as possible. So. Wow. I'm watching this, I'm watching this like replay thing there and it was way back to when I was showing the, uh, the carpool and 4th of July barbecue notifications. Ooh. Okay, don't know what that was about. Now it's jumped back to where we are now. Okay, I guess that's good. So anyway, um, KG, I think fresh water is the, the best advice I can give you. What, what would be the best kind of fresh water would be whatever you use to fill your tank when you're doing a water change, take that water, 
If you have chloramine in it, you'll need to neutralize the chloramine. But first, I would put it in a bucket with like an air stone and let it bubble for 12 to 24 hours so it becomes stable. Once it's stable, I would put in, if you have chloramine, I would put in my dechlorinator. If you have chlorine, it's probably gassed off by then, but it, it wouldn't hurt to put in a little dechlorinator. And that's the water I would use. Uh, nice, clean, fresh water. If that's not an option, but, but stable, gassed off water. It's not going to change parameters on those little poor fishies when you pour it into their container. If that's not an option, I would just use water from the adult tank. But I would change it frequently. Even when they're wrigglers and they're not yet feeding or anything. Well, that's the other thing. Don't feed them until they're free swimming and uh, otherwise you'll just pollute the water because the wrigglers can't feed yet. They're living off the yolk sac reserves at that point. Okay, it's 8.30. Let's go ahead and do the secret giveaway. Let's see, how many folks are in here? 278, not too bad. And there are 173 folks that can now win the $100 gift certificate. Thanks for staying to the bitter end, folks. Thanks for being like the, the hardcore fish crew. We appreciate it, fishmonger crew. And the winner, to thank you for that, is Vivian Goodwin. Vivian Goodwin, not only do you have the cutest little avatar picture ever of a little rat, that's cute, but also you've won 100 bucks, $100 gift certificate to dancefish.com provided by a very generous anonymous donor. Congratulations, you have two minutes to chime in and let us know that you're here. I'm sure you are because uh, you were here at the end when you heard the announcement, so you're probably here. So I'm just gonna watch the chat here until Vivian Goodwin chimes in, which they just did. All right, Vivian Goodwin, congratulations. You've won a $100 gift certificate to dancefish.com. To claim that, please send your, uh, well, just send us an email and say, hey, hello at dancefish.com. I'm Vivian and I won the gift certificate and we'll go from there. All right. With that, we're going to shut this down. Thanks for being here, everybody. Thanks especially, as always, to my moderators who generously donate their time every week to make sure this chat runs smoothly. Really appreciate y'all. Thanks also to the channel members. Thanks for being a member of the Fishmonger crew. Really helpful. Super helpful. In aggregate, that becomes meaningful. We appreciate it. Also, everyone that threw money at us in Super Chats or that joined up recently, thanks for that. If you are a lurker, all hail the Lurker Nation. If you're watching on the replay, hello from the past. Hope the future's treating you well. And if you're listening on the podcast, thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Until then, I sincerely hope you have a wonderful week. And uh, I think that'll do it. Bye-bye.